I, I don't know if you have noticed this, uh, but it's kind of this in, interesting uh, thing that pets sometimes resemble their masters. I don't know if that's true in your household. Um, I've got uh, Winston Churchill here, uh, kind of a classic one. That's Winston and his dog, Rufus. Now, when I went looking for this, I thought I was looking for a, um, a pug, um, but that's apparently just kind of a caricature. Uh, he was actually, his favorite pets were, were poodles. That's Rufus, and I think there was a Rufus too as well. Um, uh, this one looks more like the master. In, this is King Edward VII and his wire fox hair terrier, or wire fox terrier. Um, I, I think they got the same beard, uh, going on there. I don't know if you can see that clearly enough, but they look an awful lot the same. Uh, here's Audrey Hepburn uh, with her mini New Yorkshire Terrier, Mr. Famous. We watched her last night in My Fair Lady. Um, uh, this is 1957 in a movie called Funny Fave. Um, this uh, little dog was uh, featured and was a, a fixture with her. So anyway, sometimes we, we look like our pets. I don't know if that's true in your home. I'm not making any suggestions about anyone among us who keeps goats. Um, just <laughs> not, not going to go there. But, um, but our ambition is that we, we want to look like our master. This is, this, is what, this is what we are commissioned to do, that we would look like our master. But we often, here's one of the problems, we often set our eyes on the wrong mentors. Uh, we fix our eyes um, on the wrong models, and it begins to really mess us up. Now, this is true of nations. Uh, nations often end up getting the leaders they deserve. The leaders look like the people. And this is part, uh, I'm not trying to make a contemporary political comment here. Uh, you can let that be what, what it is. But what I really want to do is, is, is to draw you to the book of Judges, because this is what's going on. In the book of Judges, we've been here over the, we've been in our campfire series, we're going back to stories uh, that maybe you haven't encountered since Sunday school as a kid, uh, but there's an awful lot more going on in these accounts uh, than what we maybe encountered in, uh, in those years of, of Sunday school. Uh, the, the narrator of the book of Judges here is calling us to attend to a reality that was taking place in ancient Israel. The, the people were getting the leaders they deserved. Early in Judges, chapter 2, verse 10, we read, Another generation grew up and neither, that neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. As a result of that statement, we begin to see a recurring cycle in the narrative in the book of Judges. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And there were consequences for that. So on the one hand, people got kind of the leaders they deserved. They were getting what they deserved. But on the other hand... God kept coming to the rescue. He did not abandon them, even in the midst of their distress. Even when they didn't ask, as we'll see this morning, God showed up with grace and with mercy. So here's a summary statement that we're gonna come back to a couple of times today. God can do amazing things with whatever you will give him. So give him your best. Give him your best. That's not the typical Sunday school narrative that kind of comes from these things. Um, I, I have the, the children's Bible that I grew up with. Um, it's falling apart now, as you can imagine. It's got to be an, an antique like me. But um, I, I, like, I, like, I find it kind of fascinating to look through some of these pictures because I remember some of these from when I was a kid. I remember the picture, I remember the story that went with it, whether mom or dad read it to me or whether I was old enough to start reading it on my own. But one of the things that's a bit of a challenge as you come to some of these children's Bibles and, and maybe the narrative, I don't know if this was the narrative that was part of the curriculum that I was, was, was raised in or whether it was kind of my childlike impression that came from it but, but I tended to view the, 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 the stories about these characters in the Old Testament as being about those characters, as a being about them as the hero. So, you know, the, the account of Noah and the flood or the, the account of Moses and all that God did through Moses. You know, my, my tendency was to kind of think, aren't they great guys, you know? Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Joshua and Caleb, we've talked about the, uh, them, Joshua and particularly recently, everyone wants to be like Caleb, 84 years old, and he says, I'm going to take this hill for God, for God, you know, I want to be like Caleb when I get 84. Um, you know, certainly like David, you know, these, these heroes of the faith as, as we've often referred to them, and yet that actually misses the entire point that the scriptures call us to attend to. 
Uh, these are very, when, when you actually read the accounts, you realize these are very frail human beings. These are, in many cases, really messed up people. And God is the hero who continues to do an extraordinary work even through screw-ups like them. The problem is that, that, that we tend to forget that God's is the unseen hand behind all of these stories. Sometimes he's seen, sometimes he's not. God is the, the great mover who in the midst of the circumstances that are being described has been working, working a good, working an end, calling toward a, uh, well, in the case of the Old Testament, calling us toward his deliverer, his judge, come himself as Jesus and, and pointing us to this, this end. And, and we see some people who, yeah, they do some good things. And sometimes they show faithfulness to God. But in the good and in the bad, it's God who is in the spotlight through the pages of these narratives. It's his story that, is, that must be told. And he will tell his story on the lives of those who are faithful and in the lives of those who are not. It's a much better story when it's told through the, the life of someone who is faithful. Now I say all of this because this morning we're coming to Judges chapter 13 through 16, which is the account of a man named Samson. Now most of the, the children's Bible stories kind of recount this as, Samson as, as kind of a tragic hero. Here's typically how I recall at least these, this, this story being told. Samson was this really strong guy whom God blessed with amazing victories on the battlefield. Like, this guy was insane. He was the first Rambo. He was this terrifying one-man death squad. And, 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 and these evil Philistines who were around the nation of Israel, oppressing those people, um, oppressing God's people, well, in the midst of all of this, God raised up Samson to bring relief from their enemies. But poor old Samson, man, he keeps getting betrayed. Uh, you know, the, the, the women in his life that he loved betray him. His, his, his people, his, his, the nation around him betray him, his countrymen. Eventually, uh, they, they managed to badger the secret of his great strength from him. God had ordained that as long as Samson's hair was kept long, it was a sign of the Nazarite vow he was to keep. As long as he, his hair was long, he was... He would have God's strength, God was with him, but when his hair was cut, God had left him, the strength left him, and, and then maybe you recall the story, this unimaginable strength is no longer there, uh, he gets caught, his eyes are gouged out, he is enslaved, uh, he becomes this spectacle, kind of a, a, a living human, like a living trophy to the Philistines uh, until his hair grows back and he cries out to God one last time, God gives him strength, and, and, and in the end, Samson... Uh, dies with his enemies. Uh, he's won, finally in the end, uh, against, the, against his enemies. Yay, Samson. Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> the, the problem is that's just not the story. Like, that, that is not, that is, the, the, no Hebrew reader would have ever read through that story and said, oh, oh, yeah, sa yay, Samson won in the end. Um, Samson is nothing like a hero in, in this account. Uh, imagine with me that, that we're a Hebrew family uh, gathered around our campfire in the evening. Um, and, and let's imagine that we're in one of those seasons of history that were all too common for the, the Jewish people. It was a season of oppression. It was a season of, of difficulty. Uh, may, maybe off in exile in, in Babylon. And we're looking around and saying, how the heck did this happen? Like, where is God in the middle of all that we're experiencing? How did we get to this tragic point in our lives? And with that in mind, let's read Judges chapter 13, starting at verse 1. It'll be on the screen. I'm in the New Living Translation, if you're looking it up digitally. 
Uh, we're going to just read the first five verses to get started here. Judges 15, 13, 1 through 5. This is the word of the Lord. Again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them, handed them over to the Philistines, who oppressed them for 40 years. In those days, a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant, and they had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, Even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful, you must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. So chapter 13 um, is a portion of scripture that, that begins another cycle that we've been talking about we mentioned it a couple of Sundays ago, Othniel, the judge, then Ehud, the judge. Last Sunday, Colin talked about it with, with Deborah, the judge. Next Sunday, Colleen McCubbin. I have asked her to talk about Gideon. We're going to look at the cycle that recurs in Gideon's life as well. That's the account, the major account that precedes Samson. And in all of these accounts, uh, we find that the people did evil. Uh, and, and then Yahweh, the God of Israel, sends a nation to oppress them because they've done evil. But the people cry out to Yahweh for deliverance, and he raises up a deliverer, a judge. The oppressor is defeated, and then the people have rest. So that's the cycle that we find multiple times in this, the, the book of Judges, over and over again from beginning to end, sort of. The problem is, that all of this is taking place in an environment that was introduced to us back in chapter two, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So these accounts are taking place in a relatively godless void in the nation. The, the people, as we move through the account, are, are moving further and further away from Yahweh, their God. And each judge that God raises up is less and less and less godly. It's as though the raw materials that God has to work with are increasingly corrupt, are of lesser and lesser quality until we get to Samson. And this guy is a horrible human being. Like there's just really no other way to describe him. And yet God is at work in this story, God can do amazing things with whatever you give him. He deserves your best. That's not what we've got in this story, though. This is an account that starts with a very, very encouraging event. We read it a moment ago. The angel of the Lord once again showed up in Israel. So we're going to call this divine intervention. God has shown up in the story. Yay, God. Isn't that fantastic? And it says the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and described her circumstance and said, look, I am in this and something good is coming. Describes the child that's going to be born. This is great, great news. The angel of the Lord, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. This is a reference to God himself showing up in history. This is like a, a temporary incarnation. It, it's like Jesus showing up before Bethlehem, if you will. He looks like a man. He speaks like a man, but at some point in the story, you realize there is no, this, this is not a human being. Like, there is, wow, wow, you know. The angel of the Lord appeared back in Judges chapter 2. We spoke of it a couple of weeks ago. He spoke about judgment, and the people wept. The angel of the Lord appears in Judges chapter 6, calling Gideon to action. We'll look at that next Sunday. And here the angel of the Lord appears in chapter 13, promising that the deliverer, Samson, would come. And this has got to be good news for the people of Israel. If we're gathered around the campfire, we're telling the stories and working our way through these accounts, it's like, oh, good. God's showing up even in the middle of the people doing evil. 
We'll throw a map up here for a moment just to give you a little bit of orientation. You can see the Mediterranean Sea off to the left there in that picture. And, and, and then the green sort of little blob there is, the, is Dan. That's the tribe of Dan, which we're talking about. That's where um, Gideon is from, his family's from. And then just below that, you'll see the gold area, which is Judah. Uh, they're going to be drawn into the story here in just a moment. And, and then look at the tan strip right by the Mediterranean that's to the bottom of the screen, the bottom of the, of the map. There's Philistia. Uh, that's where the Philistines live. Those are the bad guys. Except by the time we get to the end of the story, you really can't tell the good guys from the bad guys. You know, like, you're looking for white hats. <laughs> there aren't none, right? So, so that gives you a little bit of orientation to the area. You know, so Dan is right proximate to Philistia. Likewise, Judah is right proximate. So these are the, the tribes of Judah, the tribes of Israel, that are all immediately connected in all of this. And the angel of the Lord showed up, promises that he's going to bring a deliverer, a judge who will bring relief from these evil oppressors who are beating up on God's people. But once again, we're confronted with with this question and, and this concern for, for human obedience. Like, like, will God's people walk with him faithfully? So we come to Judges chapter 14, verse 1. One day when Samson was in Timnah. Okay, so chapter 13, angel of the Lord shows up, promises the deliverer. Uh, Manoah and his wife are going to get pregnant. They have this child. And then we fast forward to his young adult years. That's where we are here, chapter 14. Samson was in Timnah. One of the Philistine women caught his eye. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. His father and mother objected. Isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among all the Israelites you could marry? They asked, why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. His father and mother didn't realize the Lord was at work in this, creating an opportunity to work against the Philistines who ruled over Israel at that time. Now, God can do amazing things with whatever you give him. So, so, so the, the appeal is that we would give him our best, but that's not what he's going to get from Samson. So, I mean, the story goes, begins so well, right? God's showing up among the people, but then it takes this dark and very dangerous turn. Now tell me this, little quiz, uh, in the account that I just read, uh, which of the Ten Commandments were violated? Right? So, so think through them a little bit. So I have no other God. Don't make any idols. Uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Honor your father and... Okay, ding, 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 ding. All right, there's there, at least that one. Honor your father and mother uh, that it may go well with you in the land. It's the, the first uh, promise, is the first commandment with a promise, Jesus said. Um, so, so we've got a violation of the Ten Commandments, so we know there's something going wrong here. Uh, maybe, maybe Samson, grew, he says, you know, a generation grew up that didn't know the Lord and what he'd done in Israel. So, you know, maybe we can give him a bit of, you know, give, give him a buy uh, because he didn't know. Uh, well, but that's not the only thing that's gone wrong here, right? Uh, we have already read that Samson was to be dedicated to the Lord through his entire life. It was called a Nazarite vow. Uh, we read about it earlier in the, the law, the Torah. Um, it, was, it was understood to be a few days, you know, a, a week, maybe two weeks. That we, but in this case, in Samson's case, this sort of uh, extreme devotion to the Lord, it's my, maybe even priestly, this extreme devotion to the Lord uh, was to be throughout his entire lifetime. Now we know, because we've been in the book of Joshua and then the book of Judges, through the summer, we know that intermarriage with uh, people who did not worship Yahweh was a, a grave concern for God. Uh, the, the concern was that their faith would become watered down and, and compromised, and that then God's work would be slowed down and maybe even grind to a halt. That this was the concern. So, so, so what is Samson doing here? A guy who's supposed to be dedicated to the Lord throughout his entire lifetime, what's he doing looking to marry a Philistine woman? I, I, I get it, she's beautiful. Uh, but what's he doing? What is going through his head? Now the story gets even more conflicted because if we kept reading, we'd see that Samson and his family are head down to Timnah for sort of the, the meet and greet with the family. Uh, and on the way, a lion attacks them. Si Samson, in his great strength, uh, kills him with his bare hands, kills this lion with his bare hands. 
Um, on the second trip down, he pulls aside to see, oh, I wonder what happened with that lion's carcass. And, and lo and behold, some bees have made a honey a hive in the, the, the carcass of this dead animal. He's like, ah, oh, honey, he's not great. And he takes some honey, gives it to his parents, has it himself. Okay, he's supposed to be consecrated to the Lord, set apart to the Lord. It's called ritual cleanness. Well, dead carcasses are not okay. It was spelt out in the law, not okay. That, that, that makes you ritually unclean, let alone eating food from a dead carcass carcass super not okay we know you know germs and stuff like that. Um, but 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 that's that's got nothing to do with it in this case this is about ritual cleanness and 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 we could say okay well maybe he didn't know the ten commandments maybe you know his his biblical training has been compromised here but he knows this he knows he's supposed to remain ritually clean the angel of the lord said it he's going to recount some of it in the in the the prose that continue, the story that continues here. So, so, so what we're dealing with here is not Samson's ignorance to what God wants, it's Samson's rebellion against what God has instructed. Samson didn't care what God instructed concerning uh, responding to the leadership of his parents. Samson didn't care uh, uh, about what God had said about being consecrated and set apart uh, uh, spiritually being united with someone who does not share his faith. Uh, he didn't care what God had said about you know, dead carcasses and you know, I'm, honey there, I'm going to eat it, whatever I want. It. Whatever I want is what... So, so you're getting a bit of a picture. And, and, the, and, and then the further part of the picture is that none of this was terminal. Like none of this was going to result in God zapping him and, and, and pulling him out of the story. But as we're reading the account, we can see the markers, Right? Like we can see there's something really wrong here with this young man's life and that there is a trajectory being established that is, that is not going to go to good places. What are, what are the events that are going on in your life that are actually foreshadowing where you are going to end up? What's taking place? This, this morning's an opportunity to push pause and to take stock and say, do you know what? There is a predictable end to the trajectory of the path that I'm on unless we make some changes this morning. Let me just leave that with you to think about. Now, the story gets even more confusing if it's not already conflicted enough because we already read back in verse 4 that the Lord seems to be behind all of this. Like, what are we supposed to do with that? How do we reconcile? Like, did God say one thing and then sanction another? Like, is he have of two minds or something? Certainly not. Certainly not. Moses, Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He's not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? <laughs> no. No. God can do amazing things with whatever you give him. But in this case, Samson has given him far less than his best. And yet God will do amazing things. However, it is going to be extremely costly for this young man. You'll notice as the story goes on, God doesn't stop working because of Samson's sin against his parents. God doesn't stop working because Samson ignored the command to stay ritually clean. God's still working. Nor does God abandon Samson when he marries this pagan Philistine woman. Now, it ended up being a very unhappy honeymoon. <laughs> like I'm just saying. But God had not abandoned them. In fact, God was continuing to be at work even though Samson was disobedient, disobedient and rebellious. We speak of this as God's grace. Favor that we cannot earn and yet he pours out to us his grace, his mercy, inviting us to draw near to him out of the brokenness of the story that is our life thus far. 
So let me continue on. So Samson shows up for his wedding in the town of Timnah. The Philistines took one look at him. This is the only indication that maybe the guy was buff. I know the pictures always show him as buff, but it's God's strength, not his strength. So I've often wondered whether or not he was actually, a, you know, a, a toothpick. And, and, and then it's like, whoo, where did all that strength come from? I don't know. But, but maybe, maybe there was some evidence that he was buff because he showed up at this wedding. The Philistines take one look at him and they give him a 30, 30 guys as his armed guards. Now they call them his companions. Ha! <laughs> Uh, you know, like they would, they, 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 in some of your translations, they maybe call him wedding attendants. You know, in modern parlance, we would say that they were his groomsmen. But, but that's not what's going on. He doesn't know any of these guys. They're not his buddies. They're not there to cheer him on. They're there to guard him. Uh, because the Philistines are terrified already of what Samson can possibly do. And maybe you've read the account from here. He decides he's going to have some fun with these uh, 30 guys that are, that are with him, that he's stuck with. And he gives, he gives them a riddle. We know it's a riddle about a lion and some honey. Uh, they don't know, couldn't have possibly figured it out, probably. Um, uh, but they are so ticked off, like they are not going to be out the bet. The bet is a full set of clothing, 30 sets given to him. He loses, he's got to give 30 sets of clothing back to, to his groomsmen. So his groomsmen threaten the life of his bride, Samson's bride, and her family. Nice guys, eh? Hey, come to our wedding and celebrate with us. Why don't you? And, and, and she is distraught. And so the next seven days of the wedding feast, she is unconsolable. And, and, and finally, Samson tells her what the riddle is. She tells the guys. Um, what follows is an awful lot of death and destruction. Okay, I'm just, this is just the, the PG-13 warning here because it gets, it gets really, really messy. Now remember, the Israelites were doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord handed them over to the Philistines to chasten them, to rebuke them, correct them. And the angel of the Lord promised that he was going to use Samson to begin to rescue Israel. So this is the backdrop. The problem is that mixed with the justice that God was bringing, the correction that he was bringing to turn the people back to himself, uh, the, the justice that's being poured out against the Philistines, uh, godless, violent, uh, hor horrific uh, people group. Uh, it is, there's this flagrant immorality of, of the agent of God's deliverance, Samson. Flagrant immorality, like it is insane what this guy is going into. The, he's the one that God has assigned to fix the problem, and yet he has become the poster child for screw-ups. So, so let me summarize what happens from here. Samson killed 30 men in order to get their, take their clothes and pay his gambling debt. The Philistines aren't happy about this, so they retaliate by murdering Samson's wife and her family. Well, Samson's not happy about that, so he re-retaliates uh, by destroying with fire all the crops of the Philistines in the area. Grain, vineyards, uh, orchards, the whole deal, it's all burned up, which, which you can imagine the crisis that puts the Philistines into. This is you know, poverty, this is famine, uh, this is a, a huge deal. So they come out in force against Samson's cousins, the people of Judah. They say, well, we want Samson. So his cousins go and find him. He agrees to, to allow them to hand him over to the Philistines. Um, they take him to the Philistines. They step back, and the guy goes ballistic. You know, picks up a, a fresh jawbone of a donkey and kills a thousand soldiers in one battle. Um, it's, it, it's, it's unimaginable. This guy is Rambo. He's like this one-man death squad, and, and it's terrifying. Now, I wish the story ended there. Because in this sort of narrative cycle that we find in the book of Judges, um, uh, people do evil, uh, God raises up a nation to oppress them, uh, they cry out to the Lord, he raises up a, a deliverer, uh, the deliverer serves God's purposes, uh, the oppressors are pushed off, and then the people have peace. The people have peace uh, for usually a longer period of time than the, the period of oppression. 
But that's not what happens here. So, so the people do evil in the eyes of the Lord. We read that already. Yahweh sends a nation to oppress them. That was the Philistines. The people cry out. Now hang on a minute here. We, we didn't actually read that one, did we? The people didn't cry out to Yahweh. They didn't cry out to God for help. It seems that the people have perhaps even forgot to be able to cry out to God. There's something very wrong going on here. And so they end up getting this leader who looks very much like themselves. Like, yes, he is a basket case, but, but so are the people that he's leading. But God in his mercy raises up a deliverer nonetheless. Modern literature would probably refer to him as an anti-hero. If you're, like he's Deathpool or something like that. Like, like this guy, so an anti-hero in literature is, is a, a person who affects some rescue but, but it's so severely marked by moral failure, character deficits uh, that, that you really can't see them as a hero at all. All you can say is they brought a little bit of relief in a time of difficulty. So that's what goes on. And, and then the, the, the narrative cycle continues. The oppressor is defeated. Well, sort of. Like, not really. Um, Uh, And then the people have rest. Well, we don't get that at all. So uh, let me just read it for you. Judges 15, verse 20. Samson judged Israel for 20 years during the period when the Philistines dominated the land. No rest from the oppressors. No change going on here. I wish wish the story had ended there. Because then at least maybe we could say, okay, Samson was a basket case when he was young. You know, it was was youthful... um, uh, headstrong immaturity, right? You know, but it, yeah, he disrespected his parents and he disregarded the Ten Commandments and, and, and he disobeyed the specific instructions of the angel of the Lord. But when he, surely when he got older, he got wiser, right? And, and he started to make some better choices and live differently. Well, we've got to read on into Judges chapter 16 because that's not what happens at all. In fact, there are two more very serious incidents that the narrator tells us about. One, one is about um, Samson with a Philistine woman who's a prostitute. Spends the night in her city and then knows a trap's been set for him and so he busts the gates out, carries them to the far hill, leaves the city vulnerable to attack by marauders. What's he doing? What's he doing, right? Uh, 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 the, and then there's, this, then there's this insane account with another Philistine woman, a, a woman named Delilah. She's this third femme fatale in in this this tragic account. Narrator tells us that Samson deeply loved her. But she has been bought by the leaders of her people, by the Philistines, and will betray Samson for money. So the leaders, with his first wife, they threatened her, and in the end she ended up dying anyway. Uh, with, With this woman, they they bribe her, and she betrays him for money. Uh, and, and Samson, by this time in the narrative, is such a pathetic man that, that, that even after she's betrayed him three times, um, he still trusts her and ultimately confided the secret of his strength in her. She betrays him. He's captured, eyes plucked out. Um, and, and then in his suicide, he kills a bunch of Philistines. Yay, Samson. <laughs> right? What do we do? What do we do with a narrative like this? There, there is some value in being able to look at a story like this and find yourself in the story. Where, where would I be in this story? Uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm like uh, the Israelites, and we, we've forgotten. We're not paying attention to God. We're not following God. We're not passing faith to the next generation. Far be it. Far be it. Uh, if that's the case, then, then that, let's, let's choose to make some different choices right now for your family, for your kids, for your grandkids. Maybe you say, look, I'm like Samson. Uh, that's where I find myself in the story. I'm, I'm like Samson. You know, like I just keep making these foolish choices and tripping myself up time and time again, failing to give God the best I could give him, and so he's working with the scraps. He's still, he's still going to accomplish a good work, but it'll be in spite of me, not because of me. So, so, so looking in the narrative, where am I found? That's one approach that we can take that can be helpful. There's another 
There's another approach that, that I think is worth, it's an even greater benefit is maybe the way to say it. And that's looking, gazing long at, at the God who is at work in this, in this account. Because our ambition needs to be that we increasingly would look like our master. And his story is being told in, in the pages of the lives of really broken human beings here. And we look at this story and it's, it's hard to see uh, who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Like, like it's, it's just one big blur of black hats. But, but God is the hero here. There's the white hat. God's the hero in the midst of this. Uh, 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 he's, he's telling his story in the pages of their stories. And, and the same God it continues to be at work and he is writing his story on the page of your life as well. So the, so the first thing that we need to do when we, when we grapple with what's going on in this account is, is we need to grieve the cost of sin. We've got to grieve the... I mean, just how utterly costly sin is. It destroys, sin ruins people's lives. It separates us from God. Sin must ultimately be judged for what it is. And sinners will eventually face the full wrath of God on the sin that they are responsible for. It is a grievous thing that requires us to respond to this truth. Samson's was a life that was lived out of control. That, like, no self-control. He was a slave to his passions. He seems to have put no effort into reining in his appetites for sex, uh, for revenge. Uh, he hasn't brought any of this into submission to God. We grieve. And the second thing we need to do is we need to acknowledge uh, our need for a savior. That these biblical accounts demonstrate over and over and over again that even when God stepped in to this, this point of history, human beings continue to be bent toward evil. What we need is a, a deliverer who can affect an, an internal transformation in each one of us. We, we need God to take our hearts of stone and turn them into hearts of clay, moldable in his Hands. This is the kind of deliverer that we truly and ultimately need. Thanks be to God, this is who Jesus is. As he comes, as, as the deliverer who does walk in obedience to God. He comes as the deliverer who sets aside what he wants in order to give us what we most need. And so we grieve, we acknowledge our need for a, a, a rescuer, a savior. And then thirdly, we, we worship the one who continues to write his story in us. Like, like, like truly this needs to bring us to the place where we see the white hat and we say, that's my God! He is so good and he continues to do his good work, even in the midst of the brokenness of our worlds, even in the midst of the brokenness of my own life. In response to this need, God has come among us himself, not as the angel of the Lord, but as Jesus the Christ, God with skin on. Jesus became that obedient judge deliverer. Rather than gratifying himself, he sacrificed himself. And he's inviting you to find your identity in him. I want to invite you to bow your head with me. And maybe you're at the place where you, you're ready to follow. You're ready to follow Jesus. I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me and then join in the celebration of his victory over sin and death in just a moment. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning inviting you to shine the light of your truth into our lives. Lord Jesus, would you shine the light of your truth into my life? Expose the sin that is there. Would you help me confess that sin to you right now? Lord Jesus, will you forgive my sin? I'm asking. And Holy Spirit, 
would you come into my life and would you help me, would you teach me to walk in the new ways that are to be found in you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Just with your heads bowed, eyes closed. To make this possible, Jesus went to the cross and died the death that I deserve because of my sin. And now he invites me, he invites you to live in him. He invites his life to be lived through you and me. His story to be written on the pages of your life. 